Welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, a podcast where we dig into the fascinating issues, conditions, and quandaries in the massage and manual therapy world today. I'm Whitney Lowe. And I'm Till Luca. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Thinking, Thinking Practitioner. Practitioner. Hi, this is Till Luca. This summer, I'll be offering my ankle issues course via live stream. This will be the first time this course, which is the latest in my advanced myofascial technique series, will be available remotely or by recording. You can join us live. You can uh, even bring a client and work on it there with us uh, in real time if you want CAMT credit or certification credit, or the course is affordable enough that you can just sign up and watch the recording later at your leisure. All those options will earn you NCB credit. And for a limited time, thinking practitioner listeners like you can save an extra 15% with the coupon TTP at checkout. If you go to advanced-trainings.com and sign up for the ankle live stream, you'll see all those options there. That sounds like a great option. I might want to do that myself, I think, even. That'd be great so, to have it. All right. Uh, and also, keep in mind, Books of Discovery has been a part of the massage therapy and bodywork world for over 25 years. Nearly 3,000 schools around the globe teach with their textbooks, e-textbooks, and digital resources. And Books of Discovery likes to say learning adventures start here, and they find that same spirit here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast and are proud to support our work, knowing we share the mission to bring the massage and bodywork community thought-provoking and enlivening content that advances our profession. Instructors of manual therapy education programs can request complimentary copies of Books of Discovery's textbooks to review for use in their programs. Please reach out at booksofdiscovery.com. Uh, listeners like you can explore their collection of learning resources for anatomy, pathology, kinesiology, physiology, ethics, and business mastery at booksofdiscovery.com, where thinking practitioner listeners save 15% by entering thinking at checkout. Whitney, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. And how are you doing today, sir? Well <laughs> enough. Thanks very much. All what right. are we talking about today? Well, as kind of a hat tip to your foot and ankle course, we thought maybe we should talk about the foot and ankle today. I don't think we've done an episode on this in quite some time. Um, so go. we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into some locomotor foot and ankle issues today. And you have some great ideas you sketched out for us, and I'm looking forward to learning those along with your delivery. And I'll add in a few things here and there. But uh, you wanted to start us off with the anatomy of the ankle. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, if we, well, before we do that, I'm wondering if I could just brainstorm with you for a second about why ankle work is even important in our practices. Yeah. As, and whether you're a massage therapist or a structural integration worker or mm -hmm. acupuncturist, whatever you do. The first thing that I think of is it's the second most common amateur athletic injury. After the only thing the uh, amateur athletes get more of are hamstring tears, apparently. Interesting. It's super common. It is supposed to be the first or the most common soft tissue lower extremity injury. So I wonder if that's oh. take out the amateur athletes and like everybody okay. sprained their ankle, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So. It's, yep. Number one or number two. Yeah. You'll see a lot of them. And whether you're involved in athletics or not, again, you've probably twisted your ankle, probably know somebody who has and get clients in there. And it affects everything. The ankle isn't just this funny little part between your foot and leg. It's uh, it's where you balance. Mm -hmm. It's the most focused part of your weight transmission system through your skeleton. Yeah. And there's just two little surfaces there that are transmitting all of your weight. And uh, your overall mobility depends so much on what's happening there. And it's both your coordination and awareness of that area, but also how comfortable and how mobile it is as well. Yeah. You know, it's pretty remarkable when you think about this. We we often study things like biomechanics in ways that are easy to study, like a flat force plate in a laboratory. But the the way in which the foot and ankle complex adapts to alterations in ground surface or, you know, mm. obstacles that you may step on or move over or things like that, it's really fascinating yeah. and, and quite remarkable what it's capable of doing. And force yeah. dissipation, when you think about the the impact load of body weight on the ground over and over again from each foot strike, pretty substantial for being able That's to right. distribute those forces. That's right. And especially if mm -hmm. if people are trained in soft tissue therapy, sometimes the ankle is a blank spot in their map because yeah. there's not a ton of soft tissue there or what's there is pretty dense, mm -hmm. a lot of bone there. In fact, the ankle, as I understand it, is the joint 
whose range of motion changes the least under anesthesia. Oh, really? It's the, oh. Yeah, it's got the most structural components to it that aren't affected by muscle tone. Interesting. So its range of motion stays pretty constant even in anesthesia. But something like the shoulder gets much more mobile and you have to be careful. Yeah. Those right. arms. Well, you know, as I'll certainly say this from the massage therapist perspective that, you know, I often tell people we look at the world through muscle colored glasses yeah, um, right. because that's how we learn everything. And, uh, you know, we talk about the leg muscles, we talk about the foot muscles, but you don't talk about the ankle muscles much because yeah. everything there really aren't muscles in the ankle so much. It's just everybody's spanning across that joint, but there's not, um, you know, muscles that we think of as much uh, about ankle movement, I think. Good point. Or if fascial structures are interesting, we're learning more about those through, through my fascial colored glasses. That's right. Yeah. I see a lot of those and uh, we'll talk about those. Your, your comment about the ankle muscles makes me think of the talus, mm -hmm. which people say is the only bone that doesn't have direct muscular attachments to it. Is that how you think of it? You think, you I have of? often heard that, but I also have to make the caveat because somebody reminded me about this one time. The malleus, incus, and stapes also uh, have no muscle attachments. That is little really bones in your ear. Tiny little bones in your ear. Muscles in there either. That's, That's right. Fine. Yeah, but go. I think in the in the major lo we can call about this in the locomotor skeleton. I think uh -huh. only muscle or only bones without muscle attachments to it. So, well, what else should we know about the ankle or its anatomy? What do you think? With yeah, so we hit on a couple things there with some of those bones. So, of course, you know, we we talked about the talus, but of course, when you talk about the ankle, the big ones that we have to think about are the major force distribu uh, distributing bones of the tibia, fibula, the talus, of course, underneath them. And mm -hmm. then the calcaneus underneath the, the talus. So those are the, the major bones that are uh, maintaining the structure and the design of the ankle. And if, if you're familiar with um, architectural terminology, the ankle is frequently referred to as a mortise and tenon structure. And that is one. I always um, hark back to my um, fifth grade science project, which is the first time I learned about mortise and tenon structures when I was building a replica model of Stonehenge. So oh. mortise and tenon is one where there's a, a projection that sticks up and then a sort of a, a cup or an opening that that projection goes into to hold it in place. So, so. well, I'm hoping we can get a picture of that, Whitney, for our episode image of you yeah. at the Science Fair. Or tell, oh, yeah. us, so tell, us, uh, tell us a little more how that relates to the ankle. What's the part that sticks up and what's the part? Yeah, so the, oh, which, uh, yeah, so the, the mortise is the cup or opening, and that is created by the uh, tibia and fibula. They're uh -huh. distal attachments sitting over the top of the talus, and the talus sticks up into them. So uh, we can do that. Actually, um, we I got, got a little, a little model, model there. Oh, yeah, I got nice. a little bony model. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a leg on it. I'll try to describe it verbally for the yeah. audio listeners. So you're saying this, uh, I got to get in the right place so I can see it too. <laughs> this little thing is the sticking up talus and then the tibia and fibula fit down over it like a cup, you're saying? Yep, 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 okay. yep. So they sit directly over the top of it. So that's, that, that's what creates a lot of, the, it creates some bony stability around there, but it does also play into some of the injury conditions that we'll talk about a little bit later because that talus um, is wider towards its anterior and lower portion. And when you move your foot in dorsiflexion, that wide part rolls up underneath the tibia and fibula and can, in a very severe traumatic injury, spread them apart. And we'll talk about that in a little this, bit later. Yeah. This part, again, at the, you're saying the anterior portion of the talus yeah. is yeah. wider than the posterior portion. Yeah. And so when you're rolling through your movement, that actually could cause problems or, in my way of thinking, could cause a, a movement limitation or restriction if the bones aren't able to adapt around that extra width right there. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, one other thing while we're talking about those two, uh, maybe you can simulate this with your fingers and the hand on okay. the model again. So the right. talus, uh, excuse me, the tibia and fibula we uh -huh. said they cover the talus, but one of them extends farther distally than the other. Okay. Uh -huh. So, yes. yeah. So the fibula extends a lot farther distally that than the tibia shot. does. You can see that on the, those of you who are not uh, seeing our visual, it's got a great. I don't know if it's helpful or not. It is very helpful. It's perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I'm trying to show how the. Yeah. So the fibula with his finger there sticking farther down than the tibia does. Yeah. And that means now if you were to try to tilt that foot out to, into eversion, you see how that fibula stops that movement out there. But if you tilt your foot into inversion in the other direction, 
there's not as much bony restriction there. And that's one of the main reasons why you have so many more inversion or medial ankle sprains because the tibia is not sticking down as far to prevent that that movement there. So important thing about uh, um, bony structure with them. So uh, that's good. Yeah. While we're noting that too, I just want to make a quick comment on my, on uh, the stability of those uh, structures around the ankle. That's a great deal of our ankle stability, of course, comes from the main ligaments around there. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, if I was tasked with designing the ankle, I wouldn't have done it the way that um, our bodies evolved into the current design, because I would have put the really strong ligaments on the side that has the worst or the least stability. But what happens is we have a, a group of ligaments on the medial side of the ankle called yeah. the deltoid ligament complex. Oh, yeah, yeah. Much stronger, much larger, much thicker, and helps prevent a lot of your eversion or you know uh, turn, turning your foot out or medial ankle sprains. But the most common injuries occur from inversion sprains, mm -hmm. and you just have some really small thin ligaments there, three main ones on the side, anterior talofibular, calcaneofibular, and posterior talofibular ligaments that are not very large, and they're not very good at restraining excessive inversion movements. And I would say that's probably one of the main reasons we see so many inversion ankle sprains. Yeah, that, and we have two legs. And so that other leg is always medial to the standing foot, and there's yeah. nothing lateral. Yeah. So you can turn that in and fall that way as well. And like you said, there's not as much bony structure out there, not as much ligament, stout ligaments. Yeah. Okay. What about, you talked about some ligaments. What, what else do you want to know about anatomy? Well, a couple other things are around there that I think play a role in, in a number of the soft tissue problems that we see around there. And we talked uh, a moment ago about some of the, the muscles that are in the leg that control the foot, especially mm -hmm. so with the... Uh, muscles that are coming across the top surface of the foot that uh, provide for dorsiflexion and toe extension movements. And mm -hmm. then the muscles that go down around the medial and posterior side of the ankle down into the base of the foot to control the flexion movements of the, of the foot and toes. Each of those, all those tendons, are basically taking a right angle turn as they go across the ankle, which means there's a good chance for a lot of friction because in order for them to work efficiently mechanically, you have to sort of bind those tendons close to the joint. And this is done with a retinaculum, which is that binding restriction, restricting tissue across those tendons to hold them close to the joint. And so uh, the, uh, the tendons have to slide smoothly through that motion there, and that causes some potential challenges or problems for them. So that without the retinaculum, we'd have like toe muscles going right from our knee diagonally out to our toe like a big triangle instead yeah, of like a nice corner. Pop them right up there. Yep. And it'd be a lot less efficient in producing forces. And there's a lot of forces necessary for, let's say, propulsion and things like that with those uh, tendons through there as well. I think it's next episode. We're going to have uh, Rachel Clausen and Nicole Trombley coming in to talk to us. They, uh, we got inspired by their retinacular article on the latest mm -hmm. massage and body work. So we're going to talk some more about the retinacula. And I'm sure they're going to make the case uh, that the retinacular are also sensory structures. They're sensing structures. They're so embedded. In fact, yeah. uh, Carlos Deco's counts of nerve endings has found more mechanoreceptors embedded in the fascia of the retinacular than anywhere else in the body. Wait, say and, that again. More more sensory receptors, uh, uh, mechanoreceptors in the In the retinacular. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. That's right. I'm going to see if I got that uh, yeah. right here. Uh, they're the most innervated of the deep fascia. Okay. The deep fascia layer, that particular layer that they're part of. And the retinacular are part of the crural fascia, just the stalking of fascia that goes around the leg and turns into the plantar fascia around the foot. But they're the thickenings there, and they have really high concentrations of nerve endings that help yeah. us, again, probably, they say, help us perceive the movements and positions and forces there at the ankle and a part of the coordination story, but yeah. how we get so much information from all the forces going there. Interesting. You know, begs the question too, does that maybe play a more significant role in cases of, of, you know, tenosynovitis and the pain from tendon uh, irritation as those tendons course underneath the retinacum, if they're so richly innervated, that might be a part of that. Absolutely. They're sensitive because they're sensory 
Mm-hmm. You know, it, it runs both ways. We get a lot of coordination information from them, but when they hurt, they really hurt. Yeah. Because there's so much signal there, so much potential. Do you know if it's, um, I mean, I know there's a, a whole lot in there, but when we, you mentioned a moment ago, very high concentration of mechanoreceptors. Are there also um, very high concentrations of o- other sensory receptors in there as well as uh, mechanoreceptors? Let's, let's ask. Yeah. Rachel, next week or whenever, next episode when we have okay. that. About yeah. that. It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, um, I think, going over in a nutshell, some of the main things for us to think about in terms of um, anatomy structures in that area. The bones, the stabilizing ligaments, um, the tendons and the tendon sheaths around that. Now, of course, you know, there are some other structures in there that don't play as much of a mechanical role, but but certainly have some some important um, aspects when we talk about other types of pain problems around the areas. Like there's some areas for potential nerve entrapment and there's arterial and, and venous structures through there as well. Other things. Can you, to, yeah. Can about. you tell us a bullet point about those? You've made some really good points in our plantar foot pain episode about that. Yeah. So there's some, uh, the, the big ones that we see most frequently involve the tibial nerve and its branches, which courses down the medial side of the, uh, the ankle around the posterior aspect of the medial malleolus on that, on, on, on that side. And then it goes down into the plantar surface of the foot and then divides out into some other branches there. But that nerve is very close to and adjacent to those tendon sheaths in that area. That's, of course, what we call the tarsal tunnel, similar to the carpal tunnel of the wrist. Yeah. It's the tarsal tunnel of the ankle. There's a flexor retinaculum also that goes from the medial malleolus over to the calcaneus, and then those nerves and tendons all course underneath that. So inflammation and irritation in those tendons and their sheaths can certainly cause nerve compression in there, as can you know some other structures becoming irritated and or inflamed on the plantar surface of the foot, causing nerve pain, which is uh, certainly in my experience, frequently misdiagnosed and misidentified as plantar fasciitis when it is in fact a, a nerve pain problem in there. The nerve pain is so tricky because sometimes it's really obvious to the to the to the person to the client that it's a nerve, it's tingling, it's numb, it's electric. But other times, no, it can just be a, a hurt that's hard to describe or hard to identify. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those do respond, like you say, to a more nerve focused work where we're thinking about gentle gliding or the happiness of the nerves more than the mechanical mobility of the bones and joints. Yeah. Right. So, how do we move? At the ankle. Yeah. Yeah. How does this all work? Yeah. Um, Do you want to talk about that or shall I go for it? it? Okay. So, hope you don't mind. Okay. I'll I'll chat about that. So, um, we have um, four main movements that we're focusing at on in the ankle. So, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are the two main ones that we think about most commonly. Pulling and your they, toes, pulling your toes up. Yep. Pulling your toes toward the knees in dorsiflexion and pointing your foot, pressing down the gas pedal in plantar flexion. Mm. And uh, those motions occur primarily at the, I do not like this word because I always have trouble saying it, tallocrural joint. Um, I wish they had created oh. a different word for that. Crural, C-R-U-R-A-L. Tallocrural joint, the joint between the talus and the... Pearl and is then, foot, or I believe foot, Latin for foot. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is the joint between tibia, fibula, and uh, the talus, so talocrural joint there. So yeah. those are our motions of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And then uh-huh. below that, the joint between the talus and calcaneus, we refer to as the subtalar joint. And that's where the majority of your inversion and eversion have come from. And the inversion, of course, the movement where the bottom surface or plantar surface of the foot is pulled inwards toward the midline. Yeah. Eversion being the opposite, the bottom surface of the foot tilted out towards uh, a lateral direction. And we noted earlier, you're obviously clearly have much more range of motion available to you, normal range of motion in inversion than you do in eversion for those other reasons that we mentioned earlier. So that's a great description. And those movements, understanding where those movements are happening is really a great key to helping clients with obviously movement restrictions, limitations. If it's hard for them to bend down and tie their shoes, dorsiflexion could be a real factor in that. Yeah. Or of, you know, gait issues like a limp or those, when we give people even just a little more, a little easier dorsiflexion, sometimes they feel like they're floating in air because the movement gets so much easier. Yeah. But then, yeah, for 
lateral stability, rolling of the ankle, those kinds of things. That's the next joint down, like you said, between the talus and the calcaneus. Yeah. And um, one of the things, uh, and I was going to kind of ask your take on this too. This is, I'm, I remember learning this early, early on in massage school. Uh -huh. um, they talked to us about when you're trying to stretch somebody's calf or get them to stretch their calf. It's, it's more, seems more prevalent at this area than other areas for some reason. But the fact that you can't really stretch your gastroc and soleus muscles and dorsiflexion as much as another individual can do that when they add additional mm. pressure to that. Either you get a, a pretty, you know, you get some additional stretch in there generally um, that you can't produce actively uh, mm. very well with, with, with your own movement. So it sure feels better when someone else does it to me than what I'm doing to myself. I know yeah. that. Yeah. It's, it's, there may be a leverage thing involved. It might be that like you can't tickle yourself principle. I don't know what it is, but it sure feels, there's sure yeah. things that people can do with me that I can't quite seem to find myself. Yeah. And maybe that's also some of that, something else, because you can certainly do it on the, the stair, um, you know, methods or, or the methods of, of, you know, leaning over forward and that, that kind of thing that uh, can do that. But uh, yeah, when you do, we talked about this earlier a moment ago, just to keep in mind, when you talk about the dorsiflexion movements in particular, that this does have a, a significant role in some ankle injuries, um, you know, both the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movements, because we see the ankle sprains a lot more common when people invert and plantar flex their foot not just the inversion, but this is the common injury of stepping in a hole, stepping off a curb, you know, your foot turns inward, but it also plantar flexes because that's the, mo the movement that puts those ligaments at the most uh, vulnerable position. And, and the place that puts that talus in the least supported position in its joint yeah, too. Exactly. Yep. There's yep. less support, bony support from above as well. Yeah. If I had to pick between plantar flexion and dorsiflexion as the only one I could have, Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd pick dorsiflexion. Okay, you got to explain that because I think I, you made me think about this for just a second. I'm going to definitely pick plantar flexion. So I want to hear <laughs> why you pick dorsiflexion. That's why we're doing this together. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, without dorsiflexion, let's say my dorsiflexion is limited, mm -hmm. my head's going to bob up and down pretty severely with every step I take. I got to mm -hmm. dorsiflex to even have a smooth gait to be able uh -huh. to step through. Yeah. It reminds me of like uh, high school when. We we're all wearing these monster hiking boots around, and we we're bobbing up and down wherever we went. Uh huh. But uh, so you'd have to like pick your feet up to clear the ground. You would have to uh, pick your feet up to yeah. clear the ground to avoid stubbing your toes all the time. Yeah. With dorsal flexion. Yeah. Why did you say plantar flexion? Because I like to move forward, ah. and you won't. Don't even worry about um, your gait looking funny. You will not move forward at all with no plantar flexion. So you need because, to be able to point your toe to reach for that ground out in front of you. You're saying, well, yeah, and the propulsion phase of pushing oh, forward um, is plantar course. flexion. Yeah, there so, you go. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. So good thing we have there's, both. There's good reasons for both, absolutely. And anybody who's had, um, you know, neural disorders that limited their plantar flexion from from you know nerve problems will certainly tell you it's going to mess with your gait uh, a lot. There's some significant. Um, um, neural injuries that we see showing up that way too. So yeah, I want to have them both. The movements there, especially the subtalar joint, are pretty complex. And we don't need to get lost in those weeds right now. Mm -hmm. But for sure, in the in the live trainings, we have some great animations we use and then some exercises we do to feel the oblique joint of that. I mean, sorry, oblique yeah. axis that those joints are moving around. Yeah. It's different at different phases of the joint. I think for today's purpose, it's enough just to acknowledge that it's a weird axis. It's not like a typical hinge. It isn't, yeah. And if you're thinking mobility, you got to turn your head a little bit sideways and uh -huh. look at it a little differently. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, the illustrations, some of the very best illustrations of that, and you you probably remember this, the uh, book from uh, Kapanji's um, Atlas, mm -hmm. you know, some yes. of the the visual diagrams in that uh, book about the, the motions of these joints are some of the best diagrams still that, that I, I've ever seen on there. So, but yeah, it's, it's messy and complex because it's not just uh, those simple single plane movements that we see in so many other joints. Um, right. Yeah. And you and I touched on this a little bit too, and I don't remember the episode number, but we did do a deep dive on pronation uh -huh. um, a while back. Um, uh -huh. And we talked about that, 
multi-planar movement in the ankle, uh, which actually defines what pronation is. So, um, well, maybe we'll put that in the show notes or something. Go fall back. Yeah, to that. we'll reference back to that. Yeah, to that other episode. So, what did you want to say about valgus and varus alignments there? Curious well, this about. is another thing in the ankle that I think plays a really important role in why people are susceptible to certain types of um, soft tissue injuries or or even you know hard tissue, you know, bone stress fractures and things like that. And there's some really misunderstood concepts around those two terms, valgus and varus alignment. So briefly, um, a valgus alignment is one in which there is a lateral deviation of the distal end of a bony segment. Mm. A lateral deviation of the distal end of a bony segment. So if we're talking about the um, ankle complex, Hey, can you pull your ankle up here for just a mm -hmm. second again and mm -hmm. turn around and heel toward the camera? Mm -hmm. Just like that. So for those not watching, so if there if the lateral, I mean, excuse me, the distal end of the heel, the part that would be touching the ground, deviates in a lateral direction, that would be a calcaneal valgus position. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we often see this with people who overpronate or they walk over on the inside aspect of their foot because their calcaneus is deviating there. Then you're talking about just the calcaneus or the whole calcaneal talus? Mostly the cal... Anyway. Well, you know, it's going to bring everything with it. So yeah. mostly the calcaneus, but it's going to, of course, begin to bring a lot of that stuff with it there. So... Yeah. so really the, A little yeah. bit rolled toward the inside, you're saying. Yeah. The and then we, too, need to think about the kinetic chain properties because that, that calcaneal valgus almost always is going to have an associated effect at the knee and the hip and farther up that whole chain because other things are going to get out of that alignment position and they're going to be, um, you know, having to try to balance and stabilize as a result of that. So, um, and you often see that calcaneal valgus a lot with people who have a hallux valgus, which is a lateral deviation of the distal end of the hallux, often from the Otherwise people who get, yep, who get bunions and the great toe is being forced over toward the midline there and that, now you're rolling over towards the medial side of your foot and you don't have the same degree of stability from the foot complex nor from the distal hallux complex. So yeah. that leads to overuse on the plantar fascia, overuse on the, the flexor muscles, possible sometimes stress fractures on the metatarsals and other numerous other complaints um, in there as well. Okay, thank you. That's very well described and yeah. clearly articulated. Can I play devil's advocate? Of course, I love that. And we yeah. may be repeating some of the things we talked about in our in our uh, pronation episode, but that's all yeah. right. Uh, there's the correlation between arch height, which is kind of what you're describing. You're describing a valgus calcaneus that would lower the arch. Mm -hmm. The correlation between arch height and symptoms is not well established. Mm -hmm. It's been assumed for a long time that lower arches or this valgus position or collapsed arches or fallen arches correlate with more pain or performance. You couldn't get into the military if your feet were too flat, lots of things like that. But it turns out that uh, in some cases that may be true, but in not nearly as many as we thought. And there's some famous examples of people with really valgus feet that do amazing things without symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great point because it really it reinforces this idea that we really need to think about individuals and what they're doing. So, for example, maybe you've got a person with you know pretty significant calcaneal valgus, maybe even a you know significant hallux valgus and, and lower extremity issues, and they're kind of a sedentary office worker. And you look at their feet and they think, oh man, their feet are a mess. But they're not in a weight bearing position for very much of the day, so they don't have anything that they're doing. And then they say like, you know, I want to get in shape. I'm going to start running. And they, you know, decide they're going to start running on hard pavement surfaces with their particular structural alignment problem. What wasn't an issue before might become an issue at that point because the load is changing and the management of that load is changing. So I think there's, we can't just look at those structures alone and say, that's the problem. I think, you know, this is why looking at a person's history and what they're doing is so crucial as well. So uh, something that's not in, in alignment might be a factor for someone who's putting enough load or is frequently enough to make a problem. That might be a factor, but it's not necessarily fate, yeah. which doesn't explain all the issues we see with people either. I think that's this true. A, yeah. This is a particular 
what peeve of mine maybe uh-huh. because I have very low arches. Yeah. For years, people would look and go, "Oh, do uh-huh. those collapsed arches give you problems?" And you know, yeah. my rolfers would all pick on that and yeah. lots of things like that. Where it's like, uh, no, I don't have foot or ankle pain. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the fastest runner in the world, but I run t- here in my 60s. I'm still a runner. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it's I'm a case in point of where. Uh, no, I got really exceptionally low arches. People who do an analysis go, oh man, that's got to be a problem for you. Yeah. No, no, not at all. And again, this is the issue back to adaptability. You know, the body has so many capabilities to adapt. You and I should get together and do a foot show because I have extremely high arches oh, um, yeah. and I have um, my toes. I don't know if this is you know, part of my, you know, my mother's Ehlers Dan loss that passed. She passed on to me with extreme flexibility, but I can pull my toes actively back into about 90 degrees of, of extension. Wow. And so I can, you know, tilt my foot up and carry a tray basically with, with my toes I like that. And that but I want to <laughs> see that at least. That's good. My wife always tells me about my deformed feet, you know, that are like that. But I, again, I don't ever have any problems with them. So they work well, for me, you know. Yeah. So you say you have high arches. Would mm-hmm. you describe the ligamentous uh, um, resilience as firm or less firm? How? Uh, yeah, certainly less firm because, okay. you know, I have, like I said, I've got Ehlers Danlos in my genetic tree. So that hypermobility that. tendency throughout, which also means I have sprained my ankle a lot, you know, um, okay. and because of just that extra degree of, of, of mobility in there. So, but why do I have high arches? I don't know. It wouldn't, you know, it seemed like it might be the other way around. So there, yeah. so that's also a great case in point where our yeah. usual or stereotypical explanations of like, yeah, high arches are because of tight ligaments or muscles or something pulling everything up into an arch yeah. and classically thought of as being high and rigid. You're not describing that. And yeah. my arches very low and quote in quotes collapsed or thought to be more, uh, hypermobile or less supported. That hasn't been my experience. That, that's not generally the case in my body either. Yeah. So these uh, correlations between arch height and tissue qualities, there's lots of exceptions. Yeah. Which also calls into question our strategies, our conventional strategies for working with them as hands-on therapists, you could say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it, it comes back to this question, I think, oftentimes that we've been asking ourselves more and more, fre- at least I will say that I have been asking myself more and more frequently, uh-huh. when does it matter? You know, yes. when, when do these things matter? And it's, um, yes. I think the idea that you, you can just look at structure and say like, oh, there's a problem. I'm not on that board. I'm not bo- on board with that uh, any longer because I just do think structure is not destiny, you know. And Greg Lehman's point, we had him on a couple episodes. He says, well, Manual therapy doesn't have a real good track record of sh- showing its ability to change those things. And so why are we worrying about them anyway? Mm-hmm. There's things we can change, things that maybe aren't quite within our realm. I think a lot of rolfers would probably debate that because that's what we're about in that point of view is changing the structure. Yeah. How much that's happening, again, that's the debate. But there's certainly changes we can make in someone's uh, function. Mm-hmm in their body awareness, in their coordination, in the adaptability of the tissues and joints. Yeah. That can make a big difference in certainly subjective experience like pain. Yeah. And the ease of movement. And there's probably objective measures too that we have studied or haven't yet studied that are really obviously the result of hands-on manipulation. Yeah, I think that's true. And we touched on this a little bit too in the last episode where we had Tom Myers with us and we were, you know, saying that, you know, a lot of us are kind of like leaning a little bit more or maybe even sometimes a good bit more mm-hmm. onto the role of neurology and neurological results mm-hmm. producing many of these kinds of changes that we had formerly and previously ascribed to manual loads or force loads changing tissues right. um, that there's probably, yeah, we can probably do some things with with manual therapy to work on things like posture and structure and things like that. But it might be that what we're really doing is changing more of neurological responses than we are of of force pulling or force compressing or whatever it is, tissues to make somebody's change, posture change. You make me think of a really specific example. It was one of the fascial congresses. I believe it's not the one you and I went to in Montreal, but the prior one, which probably would have been 2018 in Berlin, 
there was a very careful study of collagen supplements and ankle injury recovery. And they were doing some work on wobble boards. I'm sorry, I don't remember the reference. I'll try to go look it up and put it in the show notes. Doing some work on wobble boards and checking to see did people who took collagen have a better recovery because they had more of those specific amino acids and proteins available yeah, to, right. to, re, uh-huh. to repair the fascial damage that had happened. Yeah. And what they found, surprisingly to everybody, was that no, there weren't objective mobility chain differences between the two groups, mm-hmm. but there were very clear functional measures between the two groups that were different. There was much greater coordination and accurate control of the collagen group. And yeah. nobody could explain that. I don't know if they've come up with the explanation since because we think of collagen as a structural protein. It'll help the ligaments and tendons and fascial uh, perhaps regenerate. There's some debate about that because it gets broken down and digested anyway. Yeah. But th- what they're finding was that uh, there wasn't a structural change. There was a really big functional change. Interesting. Yeah. Again, there's no, they weren't able to offer an explanation, but it just, it made me think about how there's so many things that make a difference and our explanation for them are, are, is pretty speculative. Yeah. Yeah. And we can think about it structurally, we can think about it functionally, but what we know is we can help. Emotionally. Yeah. And I think that's probably going to you know, be some of the leading edge to looking at other kind of more locally applied aspects of this in the future. Is there a way to like, instead of orally, is there a way to target you know, collagen mm-hmm. supplementation to a damaged structure itself, as opposed to, it's just like with taking muscle relaxants and say like, you know, okay, I've got a spasming splenius capitis muscle, but when I take a muscle relaxant, I can't say, hey, would you please just go to my splenius capitis and leave everything else alone so I don't feel like I've been, you know, mm-hmm. drugged or whatever, but it just, mm-hmm. it's more global uh, effects in there. So um, I don't know. We'll, I'm sure we'll see that. We'll see that in the future, I'm sure. Did so. you get to say what you wanted to about ink? Ankle injuries? Yeah, so we had kind of touched on ankle injuries before. The common ones that we see, especially frequently, yeah. medial and lateral ankle sprains. We noted, noted, of course, lateral ankle sprains being much more common. The medial ones being, usually when you see medial ankle sprains, you're talking about a much more severe injury. Higher force loads, much more significant trauma. And oftentimes you'll see fractures associated with them just because the forces required to sprain those ligaments are often bad enough to cause um, bone fractures in there as well. The one that we didn't talk about as much, we mentioned this just briefly, was the syndesmosis sprains. And this is sometimes referred to as a high ankle sprain. So it yeah. is the the um, sprain or, uh, you know, overstretching of the ligament, the distal, distal, distal tibiofibular syndesmosis. So that uh, connective tissue between the distal tibia and fibula. And we talked about how the talus can roll up underneath those two. So if I kind of do it with my hands here, sort of roll up underneath there. Or yeah, let's put your foot model back on the screen. I'll try my little yeah. primitive so, model. Yeah, so, so tibia and fibula is sitting like that, and as that wide talus rolls up underneath him, like you see this in, uh, especially in sports injuries, like in football, where they've got cleats on that are digging into the ground, and a person uh-huh. is down in extreme dorsiflexion, like down squatting down, and then their leg mm-hmm. rotates in that position. So you you're in an extreme of dorsiflexion, rolling that tibia, mm-hmm. uh, that talus up underneath the tibia and fibula, and then you turn and rotate the foot. Mm-hmm. That spreads those two distal bones apart and causes the yeah. high ankle sprain. Yeah, so, like basically a sprain between the tibia and fibula there. Yeah, hard mm-hmm. one to mess with, hard one to treat, and, and usually they tend to linger on for a bit longer too because they're, you know, they're um, some some pretty serious forces and they're doing that. Yeah, there's pretty serious forces, and like you said, there can be some. Uh, bony fractures and things like that associated with that as well because yeah. it's, those ligaments are so strong mm-hmm. that they will hold the bones together even when the bones are being forced apart to make yeah. the bones will give. What do you think about the debate? And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I've certainly heard a lot about it from my friend, colleague, and former assistant, Jeremy Sutton in Australia, who coaches soc- pretty high-level amateur soccer and he, his view is that most ankle injuries are injuries to the outer layers, not the ligaments. And that many times the ligament is assumed to be injured, but they respond even better when we treat them, either with manual therapy or with different methods that he uses, as if it's the outer layers of uh, superficial and deep fascia around the foot and leg. 
That's interesting. One of the things that I would want to ask, and this is again, kind of like, yeah. is, you know, uh, uh, sort of revealing my orthopedics bias yes. is, you know, there are some pretty good tests for testing the stability of those individual ankle ligaments um, right. for the motions Shock that test, they, the different, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the anterior drawer test and the tower tilt test and those kinds of things are pretty accurate at, at doing that. What I don't know is, how much that those other fascial tissues might be aiding the stability and might show up as as a weak or mobile ligament when it's really the more superficial tissues out there, and that would be something really good to study. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, that's how I would probably tend to to look at that, and and also getting a lot more specific with our palpatory examination because it's pretty easy to, to zero in on those anterior talofibular ligament fibers or the calcaneofibular ligament and see if there's anything right there. And then maybe the tissues between them, which there would still be significant fascial expanses between them. If those aren't as point tender as the ligament per se yeah. itself, right, right, right. that would kind of tend to point me in the direction of being more about the ligament, but the whole thing is tender. I would, I would say that makes sense that there's probably some other superficial yeah. tissues in there well i'm thinking there there is a recording of him and i having this conversation in our library for our subscribers on our site but just briefly his point is that the discoloration the black and blue the swelling those are consistent with superficial tissue injury mm -hmm. the ligaments wouldn't cause either one of those right yeah and so that often that's what gets people's attention and that's obviously what people are seeing yeah and those recover with gentle movement, gentle challenge, gentle loading in ways that we might not want to, you know, might not think of doing with ligaments where we're yeah. immobilizing those kind of things. Yeah. And again, this this comes from our segmented and siloed attempts to learn anatomy because, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's really unlikely to say like, oh, when you have a, you know, a pretty serious, let's say, ankle sprain, it just got the ligaments only. You know, right. there's, well, there's more than one thing, right? So yeah. much other stuff in there that probably also that's got involved. Right. And yeah, that's why you got a lot of swelling and that's why you got discoloration and bruising and things like that. Cause yes, you disrupted capillary beds and yes, you probably pulled on, on superficial fascial tissues and all those other things in there at the same yes. time. But yep, the ankle sprain is going to get the attention because that's what we've learned to focus on. Um, he, this is trickling over into the ice debates. I'm remembering now he, he apprenticed with a, a rehab therapist, physical therapist that worked a lot with ankle injuries. And his, this therapist method was distraction. Hmm. And just an on, you know, field, you know, courtside, fieldside injuries. Just he had these interesting arrangements of giant rubber bands that would put a lot of distraction on the foot, hmm. basically traction on the ankle joint. And people were getting up and getting back in the game. Huh. And they they didn't show ligament injury you know, uh, as the, as the cause, but they were down for the count until he did this distraction with them. Interesting. Was, I know it was bizarre. Yeah. Uh, we were having this argument. I was at Jeremy's house and we were hanging some, something in the ceiling. And sure enough, I twisted, I fell off that ladder and twisted my ankle. So yeah. he went and got his rubber bands and put them on my foot and pulled on it. And uh, I'll be darned, but it popped and uh -huh. it felt better. And I was back up doing stuff. Like Interesting. Huh. It yeah. was so weird. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, well, we need to do some more investigations on that, and and you know maybe that reframes our understanding of what the real pathologies or problems are that are occurring in knows? there. Of course, I'm not suggest. I should say this. I'm not suggesting you try that at home. Don't go get up on your ladder and yeah, fall yeah. up. Get your right, right. Just pull right. on it. It's like to be better, but yeah, there's more going on than we realize sometimes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of, and we we talked some other about the um, you know, problems with. Um, nerve compression in this area, like in the tarsal tunnel region around the ankle as well. And and uh, you know, we mentioned the tendon sheaths that course underneath the retinaculum, often susceptible to something called tenosynovitis, which is an inflammation and, and irritation adhesions developing between the tendon and surrounding synovial sheath. Mm. Um, on the top of the foot, uh, a lot of times this is sort of colloquially referred to as lace bite. Happens lace a lot. Bite. Lace bite it happens a lot in ice skaters and people wearing tight boots that are laced up really tight because they 
sort of dig into and cut into that retinaculum and, and the tendons are trying to slide back and forth inside there and they're getting bound and restricted uh, in, in those regions. So, so if um, that was the case, if there was an irritation caused by repeated compression or friction there that it didn't like, we wouldn't necessarily want to add more compression or friction, at least not repeatedly to try to make it feel better. Yeah, you know, I don't know the answer to that, and I've wondered about that. I keep digging into the research to try to answer this question. So is like it a that. good idea to do friction massage to something like tenosynovitis? Like, are there really adhesions in there that we are breaking up that <laughs> is allowing more freedom of movement there? So, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, my goodness, Whitney, I'm glad you asked because this is, you know, an area of interest of mine. I think we had a whole episode on fl inflammation, so I'll try not to give a whole episode answer. Mm -hmm. But basically, there's a time for it and there's a time not for it. Mm -hmm. The time for it might be someone who's otherwise healthy. They've tried everything. They want to see what happens. And maybe some, like you said, cross friction or other kind of direct work on something that might be inflamed like that on the lower limb could make the difference. The mechanism of how that works, maybe it's restarting an inflammatory cycle that's stuck in the wash cycle almost and keeping things agitated. Uh -huh. Maybe by getting it agitated again with our work, we're letting it uh, restart so that it can go through the whole chain of events that leads to resolution. Mm -hmm. That's the best explanation I have. That's an argument against continuing to wail away on someone's sore bursitis yeah. session after session. Maybe we try it once, maybe mm -hmm. we try it twice, but more than that, we're probably just keeping it irritated. Yeah. And uh, it can take quite a while. It can take weeks to recover from a too deep bodywork session. Sure. On tissue. Yeah. So we may not always have the time involved to assess, did this make it better or not either, if we just keep working on stuff that's in front. Yeah. Most of us know that. I would say, you know, for me, in terms of St strategies for treating something like that. I would yeah. I would stay a lot more away from a something that was a perceived bursitis yeah. problem because there, there isn't go. really a good reason that I can think of to want to do the additional compression in there. But when you're talking about tenosynovitis, I mean, to me, the, the jury is still kind of out and I, I don't know the answers. Like, can we, in fact, with manual therapy, break up adhesions between a tendon and a surrounding synovial sheath, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Um... So I mean, we seem to get, clinically, we seem to get good results in a lot of instances, but is that really what we're doing, I think, is the, you know, where I well, get stuck? Well, if adhesions are, yeah, that's, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly something some of us are thinking about and, you know, think we're doing. Has that been tested or proven? Who knows? And are adhesions the only factor? Or, you know, I was answering more in an inflammatory sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. Inflammatory cycles. But the mechanical... Uh, adhesion between layers that can happen through prolonged inflammation or even for other means. We don't, sometimes it's a mystery why things adhese. Uh, yeah, th there's there's debate. There's people that say we can, people that say we can't. Yeah. And uh, probably the results are like that too. In some cases we can, in some cases we can't get results. Yeah. yeah. And as we kind of were wrapping up, I was going to say that, you know, this is kind of like, is a lot of what directs our treatment strategies, making some of those kinds of decisions about what do we think we're going to be doing in here? And like, is this basically, you know, I think a lot of the work that we might do around this region has a lot to do with enhancing proprioception um, and improving overall awareness of the, you know, foot and ankle mobility with the things that we're doing in addition to what we might do from a mechanical standpoint. I think you're right. I think you're right. Especially with this understanding of the retinacular deep fascia's highly innervated, some of the most highly innervated in the body. That's where the brain stem presumably is getting a lot of its information about balance and movement. We're talking to that pretty loudly with our hands. Yeah. And maybe we're helping it reset its sensitivity levels. Maybe we're helping refine its uh, accuracy or acuity of perception or monitoring of movements and forces in those areas. Mm -hmm. Probably have some effect on all those things that could explain the great results people see, even in acute situations, but especially in ankle sprains or injuries that haven't healed over time. Yeah. yeah. You get so much more results than are explained just by mobility changes, which we can also get. Yeah. So what other things do you feel, you know, key, key things for us to kind of touch base on with, I mean, I think you mentioned some things about, you know, the importance of educating our clients and some other yeah. things like that that are also critical in there. Well, it's on a really practical level. I... Maybe I'm dorsiflexion biased. Mm -hmm. 
I want to make sure someone has that I've had a chance to address their Doris affliction sensitivity or restrictions first. Yeah. Because uh, pronation is a way around dorsiflexion. Mm -hmm. I have to, if I'm bending down to again tie my shoes or something, and I can't dorsiflex or it hurts to dorsiflex, I'm going to pronate to get down yeah. there, mm -hmm. and I'm going to you know make my knee go medial and do all kinds of things to get down to the ground. Yeah. So making sure if we're just again starting from the ankle and looking at that zone, I'm going to make sure that dorsiflexion is available before I start assuming a lot of things are the problem in the foot itself. Yeah. And so and, just to kind of like back up and, and, yeah. and sort of touch base on this, this is kind of, I think what most people would tend to do, but um, when you see you, you, the limited dorsiflexion, your, is your primary strategy to look at, you know, gastroc and soleus as mm. the muscles that tend mm. to restrict dorsiflexion or what do you tend right. to look at as, as the key well, to get let's there? Let's say there's a restriction. I, I say, can you do a little squat for me? And their ankle angle doesn't change much, but they do most of it in their knees say, mm hmm uh, then I asked myself, is it a type one or a type two? Is it the back of the leg, the sural complex, the gastro and all that, which wraps around and is plantar surface is part of that. Is that not lengthening, uh, type one, or is it, the that the tibia and fibula are not adapting around that widened part of the talus type yeah. two mm -hmm. restriction. And so they, sometimes it's simple as asking, where do you feel that? And they'll point to the front of their ankle and go, oh, it feels like a pinch or jamming yep. right here. Yep, yep, and that's yep. a big clue for me. Mm -hmm. Not definitive, but that gives me the strategic way to start. Yeah. Or they'll say, oh, the back of my leg this is cramping up and tight. And then I'll go, okay, I'll start there. Yeah. So strate strategically, that's one way I might proceed there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So getting, uh, again, and that may lead you into some things that you would want to do with them in terms of home care suggestions and education too, about like, you know, can you think about your foot and ankle complex when you need to like, can you squat down on the ground? Or if you try to do that, can you think about, you know, what you're feeling in there and try to maybe do that movement a little differently or something like that? that means yeah. Something or there's some fun, there's some fun ones where walking up to a wall mm -hmm. and then touch the, the wall with your knee mm -hmm. and then play with leaving your heel on the ground and touch mm -hmm. your knee to the wall. Yeah. And now touch the wall one inch lateral of there. And now touch the wall one is medial up there. Mm -hmm. So you start to get that not only range, but the whole the variation of angles in there. And that'll not only increase mobility, but also increase the, the control and perception of what's happening there at the ankle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do think, honestly, I do think about the ability to move in an aligned plane. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm no longer thinking about, let's stack up those bones, like I used to think about as an early rolfer. I am thinking, can I find that pure sagittal plane? Can I let my knee go straight out over my second toe, for example? Mm -hmm. Is that available to me? And if not, and, and in, a, in a comfortable way. And if not, that's something I want to try to help with yeah. before going on to a whole lot of other things. Yeah. I mean, it does deserve mention that toe joints, the knee, hip joints, even the lower back, will all reflect or be part of what's going on at the ankle too, mm -hmm. that if you have, I mean, I'm dealing with a broken toe right now and it's affecting everything. And certainly I'm not doing with my ankle what I used to do when I, because I can't, you know, bend my toe joints as much. Yeah. So it's yeah. part of a bigger system that we've talked about in isolation here, but the relationships between all those things are really key. Yeah. And one, you know, one little binder restriction in one part of that chain of complex can certainly affect how the rest of that stuff has to compensate for that further on down the line, uh, just in the same mm -hmm. way that you mentioned there. So mm -hmm. we want to look at all of those different factors. And again, just to put a plug in, one of the reasons that I think, um, you know, therapeutic manual therapy body workers have such a valid place in our system of giving care to people is because we spend enough time with people to go through these things and look at these different relationships and see how we might be able to help uh, not only just the one area that they're talking about having discomfort in, but the other things that are contributing to that all throughout the rest of the body as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this holistic model or whole, it's a W maybe that mm -hmm. says use the whole foot. Yeah. It says, we, you know, can we, can we uh, engage, feel and support ourselves through both the medial and lateral arches? That's really key to the happy ankle. Yeah. So, 
Well, all right. I think we did a nice sort of uh, survey over you uh, diving into things going on with the foot and ankle complex and just putting in one more quick plug. If you want to learn some more about that, you know, come hop in on Till's coming up class there. On the oh, yeah. Come sign up advanced trainings.com for the live stream where I'm going to, this is like the 14th uh, topic in our advanced myofascial technique series. The only one I haven't yet committed to tape hasn't been recorded. So this will be a fun event to actually record it live. All and right. people can sign up and just come join us there. Cool. Check it on our site. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll mention our other sponsor uh, for the episode, which is ABMP. They do support our podcast, Associated Bodywork and Massage Professionals. They their membership gives you a professional. Uh, sorry, the membership gives professional practitioners like you a package including individual liability insurance, free continuing education, and quick reference apps, online scheduling, and payments with Pocket Suite, and much more. And ABMP CE courses, podcasts, and their Massage and Bodywork magazine always feature expert voices and new perspectives in the profession, including from both Till and myself. And thinking practitioners can, of course, save on joining ABMP at abmp.com forward slash thinking. So once again, thank you to all of the listeners who hung out with us today and to our sponsors as well. You can stop by our sites for the video show notes, transcripts, and any extras. You can find that over on my site at academyofclinicalmassage.com. And Till, where can they find that with you? That's advanced-trainings.com. Again, that coupon, if you want to sign up for the ankle live stream or the recordings afterwards is TTP. Just put that in at checkout, save on that enrollment. Uh, if you can, if you have comments or questions or things you'd like to hear us talk about here on the podcast, just email us or send a short voice memo to our email info at thethinkingpractitioner.com or look for us on social media. It's always nice to hear from you there. You can find me at Till Luca. Whitney, where can people find you? Same thing on social media. You can find us over there under my name, Whitney Lowe, on social media. And if you would, take a moment out to rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really does help other people to find the show. Helps keep us going here as well. You can hear us in other places, such as on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever else you happen to listen. So please do share the word and tell a friend. And we will look forward to seeing you again in the next episode. So happy ankles, everyone. Thank you, Whitney. See you later. All right. Sounds good.